I've had tracks of a female and a male leopard going kind of in that direction and then veering more north. Obviously, we'd love to see a leopard because it's the one thing we really haven't seen of the big five. And some giraffes. Um, and giraffes, of course, yes. <laughs> we'll keep that in mind. So the man calmly taking the heat on the front seat <laughs> next to me at Royal Malawan is none other than Jacques. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> hey, Jacques. Uh, thanks so much for having us here on safari. We, we're loving it. Tell us, how long have you been a guide? I've been a guide for about six years now, around about. Huh? Yeah. Okay, um, fantastic. What got you into guiding? Um, multiple things. I've always loved the outdoors, but I guess having lived in South Africa as a child, I just fell in love with the country and the wilderness areas. And yeah, on occasion would visit with my family some of these um, game reserves and, and whatnot. And so, yeah, I guess that first exposure really uh, instilled a love of nature. And I guess in time, that's what pulled me back to it. So, yeah. Magic. And you spent a bit of time in, in East Africa. How was that? I did. It was fantastic. Yeah, I spent a bit of time in the Serengeti. And yeah, just very different to the Southern African safari experience that I was used to, but very um, just impressive overall. Big herd sizes and open landscapes, just yeah, un unbelievable. Amazing, man. So what's it like? Um, I guess it happens quite a lot, but you know, a jeep full of ladies from <laughs> around the world putting demands on you? Yeah, no, it can't How do you manage that kind of pressure? <laughs> Luckily, this crew is uh, 100%, so <laughs> the pressure is not too high, but every now and again we'll get uh, higher pressure, that's for sure. But yeah, I guess it's all about reading the guest and doing the best you can ultimately, you know, whether it's creating an experience from, I mean, you have to take what you get, you know, nature only gives what it, what it gives, so yeah. It's <laughs> yeah, for sure. Hands up in the back there. Who's, who's, who's first time in Africa? Wow. <laughs> Me too. Very cool. Oh, she's jog too. Oh my goodness. You guys been enjoying? Absolutely. Yeah? Brilliant. Magic. So Jacques has... Right, yeah, Jacques has already managed to show us lions. He's shown us rhinos. Um, he's shown us elephant, wildebeest, giraffe. We've been seeing everything and we haven't even been here for 24 hours. <laughs> Dung beetles, that's right. Yeah, very, very special. Mm -hmm. So, um, Jacques, tell us a little bit about um, some of the, the best situations you find yourself in as a guide. They, they can be funny or they can be serious, but what's some of the, what, what are some of the most memorable things or is it an everyday occurrence? Yeah, I think there's always something special out there, that's for sure. But there's definitely highlights, of course, throughout the years that come through as well. And uh, yeah, I think uh, one of the greatest rewards of being a guide is sometimes showing something to people that come from usually cities, but really anywhere else. And when you open their eyes up to some natural things that take place on a daily basis that they had never seen or heard of before and they just that that feeling of amazement that comes from them is uh, definitely something that as, as a guide I love having that and I kind of feed off of that you know the more I can get those kinds of responses from guests the more I want to try to find ways to do more of that so, yeah. yeah I can just imagine and it but it takes a bit of a knack to do that um, I've done a little bit of guiding myself not to the level that you have but um, you know the times when it, 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 it can be tough to, to get a reaction out 100%, of people. Hey, yeah. and do you find that um, because Royal Malawan is obviously renowned as one of the absolute premier safari spots on the globe, do you find that you come under pressure from, from guests at time to time to say, look, hey, where's, where's the big five? What's going on? Why haven't you produced them for us? Yeah, it happens. It definitely happens. I mean, you can go through uh, on occasion several days without, uh, without seeing anything or uh yeah without without seeing the things that the guests really want to see and uh i guess it is a matter of just managing those expectations and making sure that you're making the most of what what you're given again nature gives only what it gives so you have to do your best with what you're given huh? yeah. yeah for sure just a quick one back on uh, your east africa and experience versus the southern african experience um would you mind just sort of summing up the 
the differences or the similarities between the two? Um, a lot of very similar species, both in birds and um, mammals, and yeah, a lot of overlap for sure in terms of the experience. I think um, a lot less tracking in East Africa due to the nature of the terrain being much more open. It's far easier to just spot things. You don't have to depend so much on on the, the actual animal footprints that help you know where to go, what what to follow. Um, so that was personally one of the things that stood out to me the most when I was there. And honestly speaking, I love the the search. The search is is half the fun on safari. So um, I I guess gravitated back to South Africa. <laughs> Brilliant, um, Jacques. I don't want to be uh, leaving uh, one other gentleman who's a huge part of this uh, game drive and he's sitting on the front there. That's Roderick. Roderick. Uh, Roderick. How are you doing up front there? <laughs> so Roderick has been spotting the footprints and spore of animals in the time that we've been here and um, he's got really, really sharp eyes. He is a Shangan. Shangan, a very, very proud African culture, and uh, we're very fortunate to have him on the front of our vehicle today. What's it like uh, working with such a good tracker? Yeah, it's uh, humbling. I mean, there's times where he'll jump off the vehicle, he'll see something that looks just like a small scrape in the ground, and it's only when you get off and get close that you actually can start to see what he, he's seen from the vehicle from several meters up high and while moving so it is humbling when you get those kinds of situations and um, yeah I mean he's got a very well trained eye he's been doing this for uh, several decades now and yeah definitely one of the more experienced trackers out in the industry so always just a privilege to work with such talent and learn from such talent yeah no doubt um, a son of a son of the soil no doubt eh? Absolutely. Um, magic stuff well uh, we're going to give this a little bit of a break so that uh, we can help you search for our next sighting. And Perfect. we'll come back on it in a moment. All, All right. right. <laughs> we'll give her a little more space than we gave the bull. Obviously, she might be more protective because she's got this youngster. Definitely Shangan. Yeah, right. Is he curious? Yeah, he is. You can see how she's waiting for him. Even when she crossed the road, because of the risk of us being here, she actually waited, I don't know if you noticed that, for the calf to get very close. And she only crossed when the calf was literally right behind her. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was also interesting to note, I don't know if you you did see, but she didn't have tusks. Um, so that's a genetic thing. Some Some will have one tusk, some will have no tusks, some obviously will have very big tusks, it, it really just depends, but uh, there's actually quite a few elephants that we have seen in Kruger that, that have no tusks at all. And usually when you see herds of elephants with, with no tusks, it's actually several members, obviously that gene is carrying through quite a bit, and uh, a lot of the members of the herd will not, not have tusks. Um, yeah, it's possible, yeah, they definitely should be with a bigger group, I would think. So that young bull might be a kind of a straggler and I'm assuming because she's got this young calf she's actually taking a lot longer to get to where they want to be also we're pretty close to Romalawan or Malawan Lodge and there's a, a water hole in front of there so I mean usually when elephants get close to water and they start to sense that they're getting close they pick up the pace they start almost like jogging and then as they get closer it's almost like a sprint to get there you know um, there's a bit of a race that happens to get to the water first because if you're last the water's all going to be murky and all disturbed and so you're not going to get access to the clean fresh water that elephants seek out um, so their goal is of course to get there first and drink the nice clean water but uh, yeah she's obviously not able to keep up with the rest of the herd I'm assuming there's probably other elephants up ahead awesome man that was special <laughs> 
So just as we're going along here, Jacques, I uh, just want to ask you a bit about conservation efforts that are going on um, by Royal Malawan. What, what sort of techniques or um, vision have you, have you got for conservation here? So, I mean, Royal Malawan is kind of guided by our kind of purpose and value statement, but our purpose is to provide guests with a complete experience and a perfect stay, basically. But to do that, Roma Luan and the Royal Portfolio see us providing or fulfilling that purpose through like different pillars, which of course include the guest experience, but also staff and the business. And the business is focused on protecting the environment and, and conserving it as well. So um, yeah, there's a, a number of things that they do to um, make that happen. Of course, just, I mean, the presence that we have here in Thornybush, you know, regularly having vehicles out with guides, trackers, and all the guests looking out, that's a huge presence and a big deterrent for potential poachers. Um, but then in addition to that, the, the, the Royal Portfolio has a, a Royal Portfolio Foundation as well. Uh, and so they've got various projects and they adjust the projects depending on, on the different needs. Um, Sorry. No worries. Oh, good. How are you? Cool. Hello there. Hello. Sorry about that. No. Um, cool. So yeah, the Royal Portfolio has the Royal Portfolio Foundation, which has various projects, and they'll adjust those projects depending on the need. And if they see a project that could be of interest, they might add it to the the, the portfolio of projects that they are overlooking at the moment. I believe there's. There's three main ones that they're involved in, directly uh, linked okay. to conservation. Yep. One of them has to do with um, rhino dehorning projects. Yep. So I think they, they financially contribute to these different projects. But then there's also um, ground hornbill research projects that they're wow. supporting as well. Okay. Um, Brilliant. And That's great to hear. Yeah, it is. Uh, obviously, their, their numbers are have been dropping and they're a bird that needs to be monitored because of their very slow breeding and um, their status but yeah it's a great project to be a part of and then there's another uh, project as well that they're involved with and that's the canine unit so there's a, a whole team of, of different anti-poaching dogs that get used regularly out here whether it's sniffing dogs attack dogs or whatever the case may be okay uh, and they uh, also can support that uh, that initiative. Brilliant. And and uh, could you speak a little bit? Uh, you, you mentioned it, but obviously surrounded um, quite closely by communities that are living on the edge of the park. I know that the community has a, has a stake somehow. In, Absolutely. In, yeah. in the, is it in the so in the property? some of the land is owned, I believe, by the communities, and they um, they are basically on a, a 99 year lease something along those lines and so there's regular um, money being contributed back to the communities obviously there's a lot of local employment as well which helps uplift these neighboring communities and then in addition to the the conservation projects that I mentioned there's also projects that I guess um, are somewhat linked to conservation projects that are more focused directly on community but a lot of it has to do with environmental education understanding the role of ecotourism and, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's a few different creches that the foundation works with, um, primary schools as well. So just trying to get uh, children in the communities to uh, realize not just the value of these places, but uh, also the uniqueness of them and trying to obviously instill in them this desire to protect these areas.